reading through the Bible in one year, May 14th, Numbers 23, Psalms 64 through 65, Isaiah 13, and 1 Peter chapter 1. Then Balaam said to Balak, Build me seven altars here, and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me. So Balak did as Balaam directed, and they offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And Balaam said to Balak, or Balak, Stay here by your burnt offering while I am gone. Maybe the Lord will meet with me, and I will tell you whatever he reveals to me. So he went to a barren hill. God met with him, and Balaam said to him, Excuse me. I've arranged seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Yahweh put a message into, Ma into Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak and tell him what I tell you. So he returned with Balak. Um, rather, he returned to Balak, who was standing there by his burnt offering with all the officials of Moab. Balaam proclaimed this poem. Balak uh, uh, brought me from Aram the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come, put a curse on Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How can I curse someone that God has not cursed? How can I denounce someone that Yahweh has not denounced? I see them from the top of rocky cliffs, and I watch them from, uh, from the hills. There is a people living alone. It does not consider itself among the nations who has counted the dust of Jacob, or numbered even one-fourth of Israel. Let me die uh, the death of the upright. Let me, rather, let the end of my life be like theirs. What have you done to me? Balak answered Balaam. I brought you to curse my enemies, but look, you have only blessed them. And he answered, Shouldn't I say exactly what the Lord puts in my mouth? Then Balak said to him, but Please come to another place where you can see them. You will only see the outskirts of the camp, so you won't see all of them. But, but from there, put a curse on them for me. So Balak took, uh, Timothy to the lookout, took him to lookout field on top of Pisgah, built seven altars, offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stay here by your burnt offering while I seek Yahweh over there. And Yahweh met with Balaam and put a message into his mouth. Then he said, Return to Balak and tell him what I tell you. So he returned to Balak, who was standing there beside his burnt offering with the officials of Moab. And Balak answered him, What, what did Yahweh say? And Balaam proclaimed, him, uh, proclaimed um, his poem, Balak, get up and listen. Son of Zippor, pay attention to what I say. God is not a man that he should lie, or, or a son of man that he might change his mind. Does he speak and not act, or promise and not fulfill? I have indeed received a command to bless, since he has blessed. I cannot change it. He considers no disaster for Jacob. He sees no trouble for Israel. The Lord their God is with them. There is rejoicing over the king among them. He brought them up out of Egypt. He is like the horns of a wild ox for them. There is no magic curse against Jacob and no divination against Israel. And it will now be said about Jacob and Israel, what a great thing God has done. A people rise up like a lioness. They rouse themselves like a lion. They will not lie down until they devour the prey and drink the blood of the slain. Then Balak told Balaam, Don't curse and don't bless them. But Balaam answered him, Didn't I tell you? Whatever Yahweh says, I must do. Again, Balak said to Balaam, Please, come. I'll take you to another place. Maybe it will be agreed, agreeable to God that you can put a curse on them there for me. So Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, which overlooks the wasteland. And Balaam said to, or told Balak, Build me seven altars here, and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me. So Balak did as Balaam had said, and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Now, 
again, we brought this one up before and, and kind of the, the interesting part of all of these things together is that this is a guy who is a prophet to the true God in a different land. Now he will um, fall away shortly after this and he will um, instruct Balak in a way that he could probably uh, get God to curse his own people. And he does that by telling him that he should just uh, tell the people to, uh, or, or tell the people of, uh, rather, to tell Balak's people, there we go, uh, to just go and intermarry with them. And then it will defile the people and God will then punish them, which is exactly what happens. And later on, as we read through scripture, you will see repeated the sin of Balaam or Balaam's error in what he does and a curse that is lay, uh, put on uh, Balaam from God because he found a way um, to allow Balak to attack these people. So that does happen later. But even in this, you see the way that, that Balak and a lot of kings thought the same thing. They thought that, well, this prophet, this prophet of God, whatever he says happens, therefore, it's the prophet who has the power. So if I get the prophet to just say the magic words, then the bad thing will happen. And that's what he's trying to do. It's a, he, he's basically putting the cart before the horse. He's completely confusing what's happening here. And Balaam is absolutely correct. He, as a prophet, can only do what God allows him to. Let's move on to Psalms 64 through 65. God, hear my voice when I am in anguish. Protect my life from the terror of the enemy. Hide me from the scheming of wicked people, from the mob of evildoers who sharpen their tongues like swords and aim bitter words like arrows, shooting from concealed places at the blameless. They shoot at him suddenly and are not afraid. They adopt an evil plan. They talk about hiding traps and say, who will see them? They devise crimes and say, we have perfected a secret plan. The inner man and the heart are mysterious. But God will shoot them with arrows. Suddenly, they will become wounded. They will be made to stumble. Their own tongues will work against them. All who see them will shake their heads. Then everyone will fear and will tell about God's work. For they will understand what he has done. The righteous one rejoices in the Lord and, take, and takes refuge in him. All those who are upright in heart will offer praise. Psalm 65. Praise is rightfully yours, God in Zion. Vows to you will be fulfilled. All humanity will come to you, the one who hears your prayer. Rather, the one who hears prayer. Iniquities overwhelm me. Only you can atone for our rebellions. How happy is the one you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. You answer us in righteousness with awe-inspiring words. God of our salvation, the hope of all uh, the ends of the earth and of the distant seas. You establish the mountains by your power. You are robed with strength. Your silence, rather, you silence the roar of the seas, the roar of their waves, and the tumult of the nations. Those who live far away are awed by your signs. You make east and west shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it abundantly, enriching it greatly. God's streams uh, is filled with water. For you uh, prepare the earth in its way providing people with grain. You soften it with furrows, rather you soften it with showers and bless its, its growth, soaking its furrows and leveling its ridges. You crown the year with your goodness. Your carts overflow with plenty. Making sure we don't lose notes here. Sweet. 
and the hills are robed with, sorry, uh, I lost my spot. Verse 12. Um, the wilderness pastures overflow. The hills are robed with joy. The pastures are clothed with flocks and the valleys covered with grain. They shout in triumph. Indeed, they sing. Now Isaiah chapter 13. A pronouncement concerning Babylon that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. Lift up a banner on a barren mountain. Call to them. Signal with your hand and they will go through the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my consecrated ones. Yes, I have called my warriors who celebrate my triumph to execute my wrath. Listen, a commotion on the mountains like that of a mighty people. Listen, an uproar among the kingdoms, like nations being gathered together. The Lord of armies is mobilizing an army for war. They are coming from a distant land, from the farthest horizon. The Lord and the weapons of his wrath to destroy the whole country. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, everyone's hands will become weak, and every man will lose heart. They will be horrified. Pain and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look at each other, their faces flushed with fear. Look, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger, to make the earth a desolation and to destroy its sinners. Indeed, the stars of the sky and its constellations will not give their light, the sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shine. I will punish the world for its evil, and wicked people for their iniquities. I will put an end to the pride of the arrogant, and humiliate the insolence of tyrants. I will make a human more scarce than fine gold, and mankind more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will shake from its foundations at the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, on the day of his burning anger. Like wandering gazelles and like sheep without a shepherd, each one will turn to his own people, and each one will flee to his own land. Whoever is found will be stabbed, and whoever is caught will die by the sword. Their children will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be looted and their wives raped. Look, I am stirring up the Medes against them, who cannot be bought off with silver, and who have no desire for gold. Their bows will cut young men to pieces. They will have no compassion on offspring. They will not look with pity on children. And Babylon, the jewel of the kingdoms, the glory of the pride of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. A nomad will not pitch his tent there, and shepherds will not let their flocks rest there. But desert creatures will lie down there, and owls will fill the houses. Ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will howl in the fortresses, and jackals in the luxurious palaces. Babylon's time is almost up. Her days are almost over. And now 1 Peter chapter 1. And since we're in a new book, let's go ahead and read this introduction. The readers of the Apostle Peter's letter were confused and discouraged uh, and by, the, by the persecution that they were encountering because of their faith. This is very similar to what was being said in, in Hebrews. Peter exhorted them to stand strong, repeatedly reminding them of Christ's example, the riches of their inheritance in him, and the hope of his returning again to take them to heaven. Peter explained how Christians should respond when they suffer because of their beliefs, called the Apostle of Hope. Peter's primary message is to trust the Lord. Live obediently, no matter what your circumstances, and keep your hope fixed on God's ultimate promise of deliverance. 
Suffering is to be expected, but it is temporary and yields great blessings for those who remain steadfast. Peter probably wrote this letter in the mid-60s A.D. Let's begin, shall we? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those chosen, the elect, serving as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now, for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith... Hold on, I want to make sure I don't lose any notes here. There's a lot of really good notes in this section. Here we go. I'll reread the text. I'm sorry. I, I got to make sure you get this. Th these notes. You know what? Let me do this. For this section here, I'm going to drag it over a bit more so you get more notes at once. There we go. Yeah, that's far better. I might just leave it like this for a while. Okay. Picking back up in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a, a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now, for a short time if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about grace that would, uh, uh, rather about the grace that would come to you, searched and, and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he uh, testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that uh, they were not serving themselves, but you, these things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. <clears throat> Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as one, rather, as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. If you appeal to the Father who, judge in, who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. 
for you know that you were redeemed by or from your empty way of life, uh, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an uh, unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you, the elect. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other, from a pure heart, love one another constantly. Because you have been born again, not, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory, like a flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower fades and falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this word is the gospel that was proclaimed to you. All right, that is all we have for today. So God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.